All right, hey you guys, it's John Britt here. Hey, I'm gonna try to do a video explaining a little bit of the Unity Molecular Formula for you uh, and how to use Glazy and uh, other softwares to do your glaze, you know, figure out your glazes. But I have to do some uh, preparatory work here on what our materials are and some structural things. And rather than overthink this, I thought I would just try it this morning and see if it goes well and then uh, We'll do the next one hopefully tomorrow. So this is the Unity Molecular System and it was developed by Hermann Seeger. He worked at the Royal Porcelain Factory in uh, Germany and uh, he had the same problem we all have. He was develop, uh, having crazing, crawling, and glaze defects and he wanted to find a way to minimize those. And so what he thought was if he went back to the atom and figure out how many atoms of each thing were in there, perhaps he could find out uh, how to stop that, okay? So we'll go through the whole uh, limit thing later, but right now this is just the basic idea. And so what he developed was um, three columns here. I'll show you in a second. This is the flux column. And so a glaze is a flux a refractory and glass former. That's what makes it up. So here's our fluxes, here's our refractory, here's our glass former. And so what he put in this column was sodium. So we have Na2O, K2O, Li2O. These are all called uh, alkaline uh, oxides. And they're in the periodic table in this first column. It's the alkaline column. Okay, the, the reason that he could use the periodic table is it had been developed in about 1850. I, I don't mean develop, but it had, they had figured out uh, properties and ways to predict things by this uh, periodic table. And so that's what he was using. So then the next ones would be called the alkaline earth. That's the second column here. They all have similar properties calcium, barium, strontium, and magnesium. These are called alkaline earth. They all have certain properties. This group is very good melters. This group sometimes called secondary melters, although it's not used that much anymore, but it just was auxiliary melters. They can be very good melting, like calcium you get ash glazes with, but uh, it's not, these are like super good melters, and these are next. Okay, and it's pretty hard to generalize about all this stuff, but that's what we're just doing right now. Okay, and then we had zinc and lead. Okay, those are metals also, and those are in over here. Okay, the next one we want to talk about, so those are all the fluxes. The next thing we want to talk about is uh, refractory. Those are the non-melters. They, they, they are stabilizers or refractories. Okay, so that's represented by Al2O3. Okay, then we have the glass former, SiO2. That's uh, silica. You can have many glass formers, arsenic, germanium, boron, etc., phosphorus, but our main one is going to be silica. And the problem with silica is it melts at 3100 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we fire at 2350 is cone 10, 2232 is cone 6, and about 1878 is uh, cone 05. And so we need to bring silica down in its melting. And that's why we will mix silica, the glass former, with a flux to make it melt lower. So sodium, for instance, will melt about 1650. So we combine those two together and we'll get some melting. So if you put sodium with uh, uh, the glass former silica, you will get soda glass, which is what's in the windows. Then uh, if we put that on our pot, it's going to try to run off because it's too fluid. So then you're going to add something to stop it from melting. That's the refractory. The general refractory is almost always kaolin in pottery. And I'll show you, the, the, this is the formula for it. Al2O3, 2SiO2, 2H2O. That's in the form of kaolin. Okay? So let's see where we're at now. We uh, uh, have our flux, our refractory, and our glass former. Before we go much further, let's, let me tell you this. This is 
R, this is the R2O RO column. And what R is is a variable meaning any element. So R2O, Na2O, K2O, Li2O. Anytime you see that structure, you'll think it's a flux. You can predict that. If it's an RO, that's R could be C A, B A, S R, M G O. Those are all in the R O area. But anytime you see that structure, you're going to predict that it's a flux. This column is the R203. For instance, AL203. Anytime I see that structure, I'm going to think that it's a uh, refractory. And the uh, glass former is RO2. So that's SiO2. Okay? For, let me just show you one for instance. If I put up iron, Fe. 203. Is that a flux, a refractory, or a glass former? It's clearly in the refractory column, Fe203. But now if I put it into reduction, I, I can reduce it down to FeO. So that's black iron. This is red iron. If I reduce it, it turns into FeO, which is then this, a flux, RO. And so that's the way we can predict what the materials will do and this shows you how difficult ceramics is because we are taking iron, red iron oxide, adding it to a glaze, it can become a temaku with 10 percent and then we put it in a kiln, we reduce it while the glaze is on the pot it's going from a refractory to a flux on the pot as we're firing in unknown amounts. That's why it can be very difficult to uh, control ceramics. Okay, so let me just get the rest of these and I know we're going kind of quick but I want to get it done in like 20 or 30 minutes so we can, um, you know, not take forever on this. I'm eliminating a lot of details. Okay, so the the next thing we want to talk about is opacifier. So that's how you make a glaze not be transparent. Most base glazes will be transparent generally uh, and if we want them to be white or not see-through we're going to add tin, titanium, or zirconium. And I know that's under the glass former column but they're not really glass formers they just have this structure. So well, one thing with this system is it's not perfect like all systems it's just a way to model uh, and help us predict things. So we got to give them a little uh, leeway here. It may not work perfectly, but it may be better than what we have, which was nothing before. Okay? So the next thing that doesn't quite fit would be boron. Boron is looks like it's an R2O3 in the refractory column, when in fact it is a glass former and a flux. Now, in the terms of it being a flux, it is not the greatest flux, but what it does is it breaks silica bonds and helps other things flux better. So it's super good for helping us to get melting. For instance, if we wanted to go from a cone 10 glaze to a cone 6 glaze, we could just add 10 or 20% of a frit 3134, which is a high boron frit. Okay? So we've got that, and then the other things that we have to deal with, of course, are colorants, because we add those. This would just make up our base glaze. Now we have to add colorants, and they too have a properties of fluxing or refractory. So those, and I will not write all of the uh, types up. I'll just give you an idea. So I said iron, Fe203, and so here's red iron and black iron. Here's copper, CuO but we often get it from copper carbonate. Then we have uh, cobalt carbonate, uh, cobalt oxide, and we often get it from cobalt carbonate. Okay, then we have manganese, MNO, manganese dioxide, chromium. You can see chromium is in the form of R2O3, so it's refractory, we predict that from this. These we predict are fluxes, RO etc. So nickel is another colorant. Vanadium is a colorant. 
Praseodymium, uh, neodymium, erbium, those are all lathnoid oxides. There's about 15 of them. They're on the periodic table right here. And uh, they, I won't put them all up there, but they are called rare earth elements. Get some nice colors, but they're extremely expensive. And then we have gold, AU, and silver. Uh, th that's in lusters and things like that. Uh, and then the other thing I like to talk about is that we have gases that we need to know what they are. So carbon monoxide, CO, carbon dioxide, CO2, sulfur dioxide, and fluorine. These are gases that come off when we fire or in our materials. So if we have sodium carbonate, that carbon dioxide will go off when we heat it up. And then you can run into problems with things. Uh, pinholes and things or you could uh, have sulfur in there from the clay body that'll cause scumming and other problems so that's why it's good for you to know okay well now what I might do is just show you a little bit about uh, the structure of things here do you see here that we have um, so here was our periodic table and so here's our alkaline See if I can get that to focus for you. Oh, okay, there we go. So here is our uh, alkaline. Here is our alkaline earth. Here is our lathnoids. Here is our lead and zinc. So anyway, you can look at that table if you would like. Now, what I wanted to show you was here is the structure of kaolin and if we heat that up, this will go off as a gas and become ceramic, okay? Now, a felt, so this structure, this R2O3 business, this is mainly three categories, flux, refractory, and glass former. So when we get a feldspar, a feldspar is a naturally occurring glaze that we get from the ground, okay? So, Potassium feldspar is this, Custer. And so it has a structure of flux, refractory, and glass former. So it's got one, which I'll tell you that in a minute, is in unity. The fluxes would be in unity, often represented by KNAO, because you can't take the sodium out. You sort of get a group of things when you... Uh, get ceramic materials and then we have one refractory and seven silica now if I was going to do a, a, a nepheline cyanide is my next one that's here and I have sodium I have alumina and 4.5 silica so it's a lower uh, silica feldspar called a feldspathoid so that's how this is represented and now what I'd like you to see is the way uh, a melt test would be. So this is a melt test of materials. I just take a melon ball scooper and I put a little, you know, bit on there and then fire it. And sometimes I'll put them in these little grid things or sometimes I'll just put them on a, um, a tile. So here's Nefsi, F4, etc. This was at cone 6. This was at cone 10. I think you can see the way it uh, melts into a nice beaded ball, just like a glaze. And just because I'm sure you're curious, this would be soda ash, salt, red art, um, barnard, and then a frit. And here's what I want you to see on the back is how the salt eats through this porcelain slab. That's why your kiln brick get all eaten up. Okay? So that little ball of things is our nephsi and that's how it's represented in an idealized formula okay so then the next thing we want to talk about since feldspar is a naturally occurring glaze that you dig from the ground fritz are manufactured glazes in certain uh, they have certain amount of uh, oxides in them like sodium boron etc. things to help you melt at a low temperature. Most of them will melt under 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Okay, but they are a manufactured pre-fired glaze. So they put them in a, a crucible, they heat them up. When, they're, when they bubble, all the carbon dioxide goes off and they, um, you can see here, this is a melt test of Fritz. Here's 3110, see the gases? There's still some in there, so they're not perfect, but normally they, they are uh, more gases out of there. Uh, this would be 3124, 3134, et cetera. And I just put those on a slab and heat them up in a kiln to cone 05. I, I put it up on an angle so they run. Then you can see uh, how they run. You can see how they're crazed a lot because they probably have a lot of sodium in them. This one is for maolic, or they use it in maolic a lot because it's already opaque. Okay, so that those would be represented here like this. Sodium, and then a very small amount of alumina. Up here in feldspar, we had one alumina. That's assumed to be one. This is 0.1. And the silica is three, which up here we had 4.5 and 7. So here we have much less. And then we have some boron and a few other fluxes, which we'll get into a little later, but that's 3110, and here is the way it, I guess I have to put it down and focus, here's the way 3110 will look, and the other fritz, okay? All right, so that pretty much covers that. I hope I'm doing okay. Now I'd like to show you an actual practical example this glaze is called leach clear. So we have, it's called 4321. And we have Custer, Silica, Whiting, and Kaolin. Usually we'll add this up to 100. That's called a base glaze. Now, when we put that into uh, a software, it will create a formula for us. And so this is the approximate formula. I did this from memory. so. Uh, don't hold me to all these numbers, but they're pretty close. We put this into our flux, our refractory, and our glass former categories. Oh, I'm sorry, I wrote it down. Flux, refractory, glass former. Okay, so that means, uh, what unity means to you is that all the fluxes, when you total them up, will add up to one, always to one. So you can see, 0 0.25, 0 0.75 equals 1. And now the alumina will be 0.38 and the silica will be 3.9. Okay, so what you need to know is some uh, to get a familiarization with the recipe going to the formula. These are two ways of looking at glazes. So some people prefer, just like in cooking, they prefer just looking at the recipe and what's in there. That's the physical material qualities of things. And this is the chemical qualities of things. Now, you can use both and both can inform your uh, work. And that's why we're doing this, okay? And just so you know, what I do with these is I say, of the fluxes, 25% is potassium and sodium and uh, 75% is calcium. So that's what I think of in my head and it helps me to understand a little bit more about things. All right, so that's what I'm gonna say for today and we're gonna let you go. Uh, think about that for a while and I will put up another video hopefully tomorrow on the math of how to achieve this which will then inform how you're looking at Glazy and other programs like Insight and how to do those. Okay? So that's it, kids.